like about the same size as me. And actually then going from having like no dates to having like a, a bunch of dates, right? And I mean, you know how that's like. It's yeah. like going, wow, hey, wow, hey. <laughs> <laughs> um, But at the same time, you have all these years of bullying, of being told that when you're fat, you're not good enough or you're unattractive. And then you start making all these decisions and you start conducting yourself in a way like, okay, well, if I give it up for free, then I'll be accepted. So you have a large number of younger, chubby girls, I'm not really sure about guys because I'm not one, but um, having sex early because they think that that's the only way that they can be accepted. And it took me getting older and realizing that it's, it really doesn't matter your size, it really matters more about the kind of person you are. But it's very difficult when, when you're getting fed that from a very mm -hmm. young age. You're not yeah. taught anything different. Yeah. Buck, do you have anything to add? Well, I mean, obviously, uh, I had a fucked up childhood. <laughs> <laughs> being, you know, being a masculine woman is something that a lot of people feel. I mean, have, you, in society, they do not like masculine women. For that <laughs> oh, well, I know why. I mean, obviously, we're challenging that notion of what it means to be a woman. And masculinity is supposed to be for the male side. So I, have, you know, a lot have to deal a lot with that when I was a child, and having to deal a lot with, you know, uh, you're very masculine. That's not, you know, cool. Why don't you act more like a girl? And then, you know, so, so I think that, like, it's really interesting that we have to deal with this masculine and feminine thing so much that why can't people just understand that everyone is just parts of those things? And that was really something that I had to to deal with on such a level that really, it, for for many years, I just couldn't really deal with myself being a masculine woman and a woman and didn't know really what that meant that I was transgender or transsexual you know so I think like the hurting and the bullying came from me too because you know I would fight all the time and I'd be so angry and pissed off at the world because you know I, I wasn't it wasn't right the way I was it wasn't the way that you're supposed to be I think the isms also create a lot of scarcity so we're taught in our society if you're overweight you're not sexual right which eliminates two thirds of the population yeah. right there. And if you're in a wheelchair or you're disabled in some way, our society teaches that you're not sexual. And if you're ugly, you know, a lot of beautyism, I don't consider myself a very attractive person and I grew up thinking that no one would want me. So I was excluded. So we keep excluding people and seeing and looking around and going, wow, there's only three people that I know that are fuckable. <laughs> so, oh my God, I've got to fight for them and I better put her down and make her feel worse right. and maybe if I put them down, I'll feel a little better about myself mm -hmm. and maybe I'll somehow inch up the ladder so one of those three people will see me and want to be with me at least once so I get some self-esteem. Mm -hmm. And I think when we and start... And then you find that they're no fun. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no personality in there. So you know, when we, we, we lean on the isms, we create our own scarcity. And our society is doing that, and the media is portraying this because they want to sell us the things that make us thin or paler or look more attractive, and it works for them because we're all scrambling up a ladder that we don't even want to be at the top of. We, we do see a lot of that in porn, um, especially like in the early periods of porn, where because porn is, um, as Nina and I both say very adamantly, porn is fantasy, not sex, sex education. Um, but when all you're seeing, when you're, it, it's kind of an interesting study because you see different uh, kinds of porn being viewed by different age groups. And when you're like an 18 to 24 age group, you have, you tend to have this, you tend to watch the kind of porn the society tells you you should be watching. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So everybody is blonde and slender and augmented and, and are these kind of super sexualized versions of what American society considers beautiful. And as you see people get older, and start to be less controlled by what their peer group tells them is beautiful. Um, you start seeing a, a, a small gravitational pull towards more amateur stuff, more niche products, um, and, and stuff as people start to explore and go, you know, I'm really tired of just seeing the same kind of thing bound by the same kind of people doing sex acts that I would never do at home. Like, who the hell does pile driver at home? <laughs> I'm not gonna do double anal at home. Why would I watch that? And so you see this kind of like gravity, like move as people get older into um, amateur porn, which is kind of more people of size, more natural bodies, more natural sex acts, that kind of thing. Um, and you know, just speaking from a personal ex um, experience, most of my fan base tends to be couples where one or both people are of size 
because, um, and, and are older, they usually tend to be over 30, um, because they have a tendency to go, oh, you're the approved porn at home because you're built like her. You're built like my wife, you're built like my girlfriend. And so by watching the porn, I'm not hiding in a basement watching porn anymore, now I'm watching it with my partner. Because now she doesn't feel threatened or she doesn't think that I'm watching a, a kind of porn that, that shows people that I'm actually not all that interested in, but that's what I think I should be watching. I think it's um, interesting, they did a study a few years ago where they polled college students and um, majority of the college students said that they would rather marry a uh, drug dealer or an embezzler than a fat person. And these are college students who are watching this porn and who, who have grown up with that as sex education. And, and finding that, um, looking at porn and going, well that's what I should have with my love relationship, or that's what I should have as an um, intimate connection with another person. And it makes me sad because I, I was 40 before I knew that. And it is actually as an adult because of porn that I found who I was sexually. Because I was able as a person who's an adult who knows, you know, about sex education, where babies come from, and um, <laughs> safe sex, um, I could look at it uh, with discernment and find what I liked. But had I looked at it when I was 10, which is when most kids start getting exposed to it, it would have completely changed my world view. And that's only because there was no internet when I was 10. Yeah. Yes, I'm that old. Um, <laughs> so, uh, I think we're all that old. Yeah. <laughs> I'm older than you. <laughs> uh, but that's why it's so important, I think, uh, because I think that people are, as far as all isms go, they're just afraid of sex. Mm -hmm. Anyone who is sexual is a threat. Mm -hmm. And that means, uh, you know, a black woman, a big black woman, a, a, you know, another black girl, a man with a pussy, all of that is very, very scary to people. I'm scary. You're scary. <laughs> oh, I own that. I'm totally scary. <laughs> Yeah, it's amazing how happy fat girls scare people. I totally, right? I don't mind it. Yeah, happy fat girls who are completely okay being naked, they're like, what? Yeah. <laughs> I find it makes people angry. Yes, yeah. that too. It, because yeah, it makes them angry. Um, when, yeah. when I was in college, I was a person who was always really okay with their sexuality. Like, I used to cut class and read sexual um, textbooks when I was like 11, so I knew where my clitoris was right off the bat. So <laughs> my relationship with my body was very like, it's for me to have fun with. So when I would go into spaces with, you know, straight sized uh, people and just be myself, I found that they kind of felt like, oh, why are you, why are you making a big scene? Why do you always have to be like that? And I'm like, like what? Like, I'm just at the beach running around. I thought that's what we're supposed to do. But I think it's because people get so many images of if you are fat, then it's become moralized that it's something bad. So you can't enjoy life and be fat. It's a, like an intent that just doesn't mesh. So it's kind of, I feel like people think that's the be all end all of happiness. And I've talked to people who. You know, I have a brother who's trans, and I thought, okay, he's gonna be so much happier once he goes through this transition. He's a very handsome man, but now he's not happy because he's like, oh, well, I don't have muscles. I don't look like the guy on Men's Magazine, and now he wants to, you know, get buff. So then he'll be happy, and it just feels like well, chasing all these isms. Is, it's just something that steals happiness out of our lives and denies us sexuality. Why do you think that the isms persist? Why do humans keep excluding others and defining them as non-sexual or non-desirable? Education. <laughs> yeah, this is, that's basically it. People, uh, people are brainwashed and they're programmed to think this way from day one, right? We're all, like I said earlier, this is what a woman's supposed to be, this is what a man's supposed to be, this is what sexy is, this is what you know beautiful is, and we're just totally programmed, I think, to think that way, and so people, like us on the panel, and hopefully like you, are hope showing people that that is not true with our work, with my work, I can talk about my own work, and really showing that yes, there are men with vaginas. It happens, it's real. It has totally made people rethink gender, which is a really something pretty 
hard to get people to get wrap their heads around. A man with a vagina is like the scariest fucking thing. Scarier than you girls. <laughs> <laughs> it's the scariest thing that people have had, I think, to really sort of wrap their head around. How is it possible that a man could have a vagina? That's not that doesn't that's not what makes a, a man, and that's not what makes, you know, a woman has a vagina and a man has a has a cock. It's just the way it is. So I think, you know, education is really one of the main factors in really deprogramming the way people are taught to think about what's pretty, what's sexy, what's this, what's that. And, and I think that, you know, uh, that's the first and probably one of the biggest things that I think is one of the important things in the world that we need to do. Yeah, yeah. And modeling it when you, when you go out in the world. Um, you know, if I go out for drinks with friends, I will always, if it's appropriate, you know, flirt with the waiter. Right. Because this big girl is flirting with the waiter. <laughs> you know what I mean? Even if I don't feel great, it makes me centered into my sensuality because it is an innate part of yourself. Mm -hmm. um, and that's why being so connected to your sensuality is so important because you're born with it. And it is, uh, doesn't matter what you look like, doesn't matter how big you are, doesn't matter how many limbs you are, how old you are. Um, you have that, and it is your right as a human being to express it. And so when other people see that in you, um, it then becomes okay to have them express it. I have lots of people, friends of mine, you know, who will come up and say, oh, I'm so glad I can talk about this with you. You know, and we're talking about like a clit. Right. <laughs> <laughs> you know? So. Uh, a scary monster. Yeah, the scary monster. <laughs> Everyone's scared of the clit. Um, <laughs> Anyway, that's, that's my experience. Yeah. Um, well, I think media also plays a lot into yeah. it. Um, and again, a lot of my, my background comes from comparing media in Japan and media here. You know, when I grew up, when I was growing up was, you know, in like the late 70s, early 80s, television in Japan actually had anything after 11 p.m., because the kids would have been asleep, on national television was sex-positive programming. Mm -hmm. You know, and sex, uh, and, and things that made sex fun or nakedness fun you know but I also come from a, a culture that that sexualizes and um, humorizes embarrassment you know whether you whether you're talking about Japanese like fetish porn all the way to like the creation of tentacle porn and just things like um, what's the American version I think it's called Wipeout there's like a game show oh, yeah. that's based on Japanese game shows and so we humorize and sexualize embarrassment and so it, you know in a, in a country where we're so crowded you kind of have to learn how to laugh at yourself and to laugh at like other people around you, because that kind of di you know mitigates like the whole the stress factor that's already going to be there anyway. Whereas American society, especially these days and ever since like probably like the past ten years, we tend to celebrate and reward drama. Mm -hmm. We have a tendency to reward and celebrate um, snarkiness. And you know shows like Big Brother and shows like, you know, Steven Survivor when it first started out was all about game theory, but now it's more about like what can I do to, to destroy the other person? And so the game the game has changed. You have shows like Honey Boo Boo. You've got Honey. You know, get shows like, you know, that just yeah. Oh, wow. Well, it's a it's a it's a show based on like toddlers and tiaras, like this whole like little kid pageant shows. Oh, pedophilia, you mean? Yeah. Right. <laughs> No, but like shows in general that, um, you know, if you're somebody on a, on a reality show, but you are the drama person, then you get a spinoff. You get rewarded with another show. You get rewarded with more money and fame and red carpet events. You get to go to the Oscars. And nobody, you know, and then the shows that actually do celebrate goodwill and acceptance, things like Secret Millionaire, those tend not to. Those tend to just be like, oh, it's just another show. They don't get celebrated. They don't get all the interviews, you know. And so, in a society that that celebrates and rewards bullying, mm -hmm. it's very hard to find acceptance. I think the yeah. media too is not only it's it's the drama, but also <coughs> there's an estimated three hundred thousand negative images for people of size mm -hmm. per year in the media. We're constantly bombarded. We're shown that fat people like I watch. If you just watch an hour of TV and you write down the number of times a fat person is smelly, awkward, stupid, whatever. They very rarely show someone who's slender and you right. know, all the people that are happy and successful are slender and fit. They're not in a wheelchair. They're not, very rarely are they someone of color. 
Um, Usually they, the butt of jokes on sitcoms yeah. and things mm -hmm. like that. And if it's an older person who's sexual, that's a big joke too. Right. So we're const it's constantly reinforced, I think. And they do it because it sells. Well, a good example of that is Miss America, right? Like mm -hmm. last, l l I don't know, last week. Mm -hmm. So the fact that she called, okay. So the, so the, she had a thing to speak louder. So Miss America <laughs> last week, um, <laughs> Miss America last week, uh, before she, I think right after she won, she had said that the former Miss America was fat. Wow. <laughs> and so she was so happy that she was replacing the old Miss America wow. because the old Miss America was fat. There was a little bit of news. There was a little bit of drama. Lasted make maybe six hours on media. The fact that the rest of America made fun of her because she was Indian American, that went all week, right? So.